Good evening. It's Thursday the 20th of October. Tonight we're going to bring you in-depth coverage of China's historic 20th Communist Party Congress, the gathering that will define China's path for at least the next five years. You're watching The World. Well, the biggest event in China's political calendar, the 20th Communist Party Congress, is taking place inside Beijing's Great Hall of the People. There will be power plays and power struggles as the CCP chooses its next top leaders. But it's all but guaranteed that Xi Jinping will get another five years as party boss. But this historic Congress has the hallmarks of a coronation. With expectations, the president is preparing to rule China for life. And it comes as the country faces economic headwinds at home while asserting its influence as a superpower outside its own borders. Tonight, we'll take you behind that stage and with expert guests attempt to understand how these decisions will affect China, its people and Beijing's actions on the world stage for years to come. First, let's go to our China correspondent, Bill Bertel, who's, who has been monitoring the Congress from Taipei. Bill, China's diplomacy is coming to full focus at this Congress, with Chinese diplomats in the UK just defending their brawl with protesters in recent days. What have officials been saying about that? Yeah, Bev, this is something very tangible to come out of the Congress this week because of the timing. So you go back a few days and you, we've seen the footage of this melee in Manchester between Chinese uh, diplomats based at the mission in that city and protesters, many of them exiles from Hong Kong. And the uh, Consul General in Manchester has gone on British television and defended his actions. Uh, said that, yes, I did pull one of the protesters' hair, and so I should have because he was attacking my government, my leader, and he was attacking China's dignity. Now, this happened a few days ago, although the, uh, the Consul General only spoke in the past 24 hours to media about it. Then today in China at the Congress, we had a couple of officials from the Communist Party's Foreign Affairs uh, Department, and they didn't actually say anything different to what Xi Jinping said a few days ago, but they reiterated that Mr Xi wants to see Chinese diplomats show what he calls fighting spirit or indomitable fighting spirit. And nobody spoke about this incident at this uh, media conference today because it was a highly stage managed affair. But it was a pretty clear endorsement that these sorts of actions, uh, diplomats going above and beyond to take the front foot and confront uh, anti-China hostile forces to defend the dignity of China, that this really is being seen in a very positive light in Beijing. Yeah, and, and you know, talking about that fighting spirit is one thing, but this is showing fighting spirit on other people's soil. So what can we expect that that means globally and of course for Australia-China relations in the years ahead? So, first of all, don't be surprised if we see incidents like the one in Manchester happening more regularly with Chinese diplomats. For years there have actually been uh, occasions where Chinese diplomats have got involved in a bit of a, a bit of biffo or whatever it is to sort of go above and beyond and show their bosses back home that they are sufficiently loyal and they're defending the country's honour and so forth. But you now have such a public endorsement of this from Xi Jinping himself. Uh, he mentioned indomitable fighting spirit uh, in the uh, opening speech. He defended the country's turn towards more confrontational diplomacy, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, Xi Jinping used this buzzword dignity. Uh, this type of diplomacy has defended the dignity of China. And again, we had officials saying something along those lines today. So I would expect to see more of this in the coming years. It's basically the green light from Beijing for uh, diplomats to take these sorts of actions. Now, Bev, you asked what does it mean for Australia's and China's uh, rather difficult relationship? Well, 
it just makes it more and more difficult for Chinese diplomats to appear to be conciliatory in their positions. And you would interpret not just their bosses in Beijing, but perhaps the Chinese public might interpret diplomats taking a more sort of concessional stance towards Australia on whatever issue as perhaps being perceived as weak. You know, the economy hasn't been um, lauded as much as at this Congress as it has been in recent times, Bill. COVID policy has been, of course, a key driver that has impacted the economy, and it's really come at a, lot, at a big cost. Yeah, huge cost. And uh, COVID cases, it's only something like 18 new cases today in Beijing. But quite amazing, given the efforts over the past couple of years to protect Beijing from COVID, uh, that there actually is a small COVID outbreak in Beijing at the time of the Congress. Uh, there have been dozens of cases there in the last uh, few days, I think actually stretching back over a week. Um, Xi Jinping has staked so much of his legacy to date on COVID zero. He mentioned it in his opening speech that China's policy has saved lives, that China's zero COVID policy puts lives and people first. He says it is an example of China upholding human rights. The implication is that other nations don't protect human lives and human rights in the way that Xi Jinping does. So it just makes it really difficult, Bev, for somebody to uh, declare an all-out people's war against COVID, which is what it's called, to then flip the switch and say, ah, oh, no, we're going to live with the virus. I did see some uh, modelling today from a Chinese state media figure claiming that if they were to open up, that you'd get around 700,000 deaths in China just in the first five or six months alone. So you do get justifications, and they are genuine justifications, that a lot of people will die if they open up. But yes, the economy is taking a hit. It was barely growing at all during that quarter when Shanghai was locked down. Uh, now uh, nobody thinks that the Chinese government is going to hit its growth range target of 5% this year. Bill, stay with us. We'll come back to you for more analysis throughout the program. Thank you. But as we know, Xi Jinping is all set to secure an unprecedented third term as president and is undoubtedly the country's most powerful ruler since Chairman Mao. But just how has President Xi methodically built his powerful legacy? Talia Olatia takes a look. At the centre of China's Communist Party stands one man, Xi Jinping, and bearing any surprises, he's about to cement his stronghold on the reins of China's most powerful job for another five years, a position he could then hold for life. But how did one man go from poverty to unrivalled power? Born in 1953 as the son of one of the Chinese Communist Party's founding fathers, Xi Jinping was considered a communist princeling. But all that changed in the early 60s, when his father, Xi Zhongshun, was sensationally ousted from the party by his former comrade, Chairman Mao Zedong, as part of his cultural revolution. With his family split, young Xi was sent to an impoverished village for re-education and hard labour. But unlike others who turned away from the CCP, Mr Xi turned towards it. And when he was finally accepted into the party in 1973, he began his political ascent. Taking on leadership positions across the country, Xi Jinping grew his profile within the secretive machinations of his party. In 2007, he became a contender to succeed then-president Hu Jintao when he was promoted to the elite Politburo Standing Committee. The following year, he was elected vice president. And by early 2013, he earns his nickname Chairman of Everything. Xi Jinping is president, head of the Chinese Communist Party, the highest ranking position in China, and head of the military. He's in the position to enact his dream for China. He wants to make China great. Uh, and probably make China greater again. Fundamentally, I think he wants to make China a richer country, but also a stronger country, a country that uh, uh, can actually uh, not, for example, have to accept bullies uh, on the international arena. But in order to do that, President Xi needs people on his side. In his first major domestic policy, he launches an anti-corruption campaign, catching millions from his party in his dragnet, effectively sidelining his political rivals by replacing them with his loyal allies. 
Internationally, Xi Jinping launches the Belt and Road Initiative, and his trade and export deals make China a global superpower and him a powerful world leader. President Xi is on a mission. He writes his name into the Chinese constitution and in 2018 abolishes presidential two-term limits, ensuring an extended stay in charge. But there are serious concerns with Mr Xi's authoritarian leadership. China has been accused of suppressing ethnic minorities, state surveillance and censorship programs have ramped up, and President Xi's unpopular zero-COVID policy not only impacted China's population of 1.4 billion, but also its economy. Meanwhile, outside mainland China, Xi Jinping's dream for one strong China meant Hong Kong was forced to bend to Beijing's rule. And President Xi has refused to rule out using military means to pursue unification with Taiwan. I don't think he has a choice on giving up Taiwan or allowing Taiwan a, a truly like a, a self-rule kind of thing. And so is in Hong Kong as well. I don't think they have much choice given the way how the Communist Party construct its legitimacy. Xi Jinping has spent decades tightening his grip on power and he doesn't appear to be letting go anytime soon. Talia Olatia, ABC News. Well, the Congress is, of course, taking place against the backdrop of an economic slowdown and a crisis within the housing market. Let's go to China Director of the Economist Corporate Network, Matty Baking in Shanghai. Matty, good to see you. Now, one significant shift during Xi's time as leader is, is away from the capitalism, the entrenched corruption that had been happening in China for many years, back to what's considered wealth for the greater good. What is driving this? It's great to be with you, Bev. You know, Xi Jinping, it's important to remember, came into power at a time when the party was, was in crisis to some extent. Um, corruption was rampant. There was a lot of concern about the future of the party. And that's one of the reasons that he really prioritized anti-corruption right from the outset. You know, we forget that the dramatic party Congress, when, when he was first selected to be kind of the, the apprentice, so to speak, the one who was going to be the next leader in charge, there, there was a lot of, of, of concern at that moment of how the future direction for the party. And I think it's important to note also that the Chinese Communist Party is keenly aware of the history of the Soviet Union and that as um, the, the party had been in power for some time and there were problems within the system, it ultimately led to the regime's collapse. And Xi Jinping is keen not to repeat the, that history. And that's one of the reasons that you saw the anti-corruption campaign. That's also one of the reasons why he wants to bolster the state and the role of the state in the economy. He's always been a, a strong believer in the, the, the role that state-owned enterprises should play vis-a-vis -vis the balance between private enterprises. And in fact, since Xi Jinping came into power 10 years ago, you saw the kind of slow but steady uptick in private enterprise versus state-owned enterprise kind of come to a standstill around 50 to 60 percent of the economy is now state-owned. And that has been about the same since Xi Jinping has been in power. He's, he's championed that sector. There have been implications, though, and, and, and right now China is facing a slowdown, uh, very little growth compared to the extraordinary growth that it experienced over the past two decades. So, you know... This is hurting people. Yes. You know, the truth is a slowdown for China was inevitable. No country, not even China, can maintain extremely high politically predetermined levels of growth in perpetuity. So a slowdown was inevitable, particularly as you become richer, it becomes harder to sustain those high levels of growth. That's why developed countries simply aren't growing at 8% a year. There's not space in the economy for that. Um, China has also long sought to kind of rebalance and find what uh, the leaders in Beijing describe as new or quality areas of growth. So they're no longer relying on the, uh, pro the property sector to supercharge growth or exports to be more self-sufficient. Um, so the slowdown was inevitable. It's been more painful in 2022, partially because of headwinds uh, that are not unique to China, that are global. China's not the only economy experiencing a downturn at the moment, but some of them are unique to China. So, for example, the property sector challenges, but especially the way that zero COVID has uh, wreaked havoc with the, with the economy. What is going to be the impact, though, of that slowdown on the global economy? It's going to definitely drag on growth here in Asia um, in the coming year or two. And it's, it's 
it's going to continue to uh, contribute to the global slowdown. The truth is China has been the largest and most reliable source of global growth for the past two decades. It's accounted for some 25% of GDP growth during those 20 years, and it's no longer that reliable source of growth. That's why you see um, lots of multinational corporations in particular wondering you know, where they should be investing at the moment, because China doesn't feel like it's the safe bet that it, it once was. So I think the, the, the role of China's slowdown is complicating and already complicated and you know somewhat bleak global outlook. Xi Jinping was determined not to jeopardize his chance at this historic third term. Is there some chance once he secures that that he might relax some of these policies in particular that COVID policy that has really impacted people? You know, so there was a lot of speculative wishful thinking leading up to the party Congress that there would be a relaxation uh, around zero COVID following the Congress. We've not seen any indication uh, of that happening. Um, there have been no kind of strong e pieces of evidence to suggest that that's happening. And in fact, the language that we saw in state media leading up to the Converge and the Congress and the language that Mr. Xi used during his own speech made very clear that, as he puts it, quote, the people in the, uh, and their lives come at the highest priority above everything else. Um, and so, you know, he's calling it this all out people's war against the virus. I don't think it's going to change. Um, I do think overall, there's a question whether, you know, is we're in a period that feels more like ideological rule for China. And that's, I think, what has uh, investors and kind of analysts nervous. So there, there is some question as to whether once he has his third term secured, will Mr. Xi recover a more pragmatic touch that way, you know, that's yet to be seen. But at this moment, it doesn't seem that that's in the cards because one thing that we do expect is policy continuity in um, with his term secured. Maddie, I really appreciate uh, you uh, giving your perspective at this uh, at this time, this historic Congress. Good to have you on. Always great to be with you, Bev. Thank you. Well, the Hong Kong protester who was pulled into the Chinese consulate in Manchester in the United Kingdom and assaulted by several staff members has spoken of his experience. Bob Chan has rejected the Chinese government's claim that he had illegally entered the consulate grounds and threatened security. We were having a peaceful gathering and we had some banners protesting the CCP Congress. Staff members from the consulate came out and tried to take away our displays and destroy our banners. When we saw this, we wanted to retrieve our belongings. And during this time, because I was near the gates, they pulled me inside. UK police tried to pull me back out but didn't succeed. So in the end, I was pulled inside and was beaten up. I believe the UK is a very safe place with freedom of speech. The fact that consulate staff can so brazenly pull someone inside and beat them up in broad daylight is unimaginable. Meanwhile, as Chinese diplomats in the UK face scrutiny, the Chinese Foreign Ministry has defended its combative approach to foreign policy. Fairness and justice are the persistence and perseverance of Chinese diplomacy. Daring to fight is the spiritual character of Chinese diplomacy. Well, in the days leading up to the Congress, we saw a rare moment of public political dissent from within China. A man unfurled banners on a bridge in Beijing calling for Xi Jinping's ousting. Bang Zhao is a bilingual reporter with ABC's Asia Pacific Newsroom and he is with us in the studio. Uh, lovely to see you again, Bang. Good to be here, Beth. Such an interesting time with this Congress underway. And that protest that we saw just ahead of this Congress is highly unusual. Is this something we're likely to see more of, do you think? Yes, it is a very unusual protest that happened in China ahead of the Communist Party's 20th National Congress. And in fact, that is one of the unprecedented protests um, after the Tiananmen Square massacre in the last 20 years, uh, more than 30 years actually. Um, we've seen the man put up banners on uh, one of the busiest overpasses in Beijing, accusing the Chinese President Xi Jinping of being a dictator. And at the same time, he asked all of the Chinese people to stand up against him, which is a very unusual thing. Um, we've seen some small-scale responses um, from Chinese um, people across the country, especially in some university campuses where students printed some flyers and um, some people also um, put them up in the public bathrooms uh, in some shopping malls in China. But at the same time, we haven't seen any 
additional responses or reactions from a large scale group of Chinese people. And this man has been taken by the Chinese police within one hour. And since then, we don't have any additional information about him. Yeah, what has happened to him. And this is not uncommon. And this is why dissent in China has been so difficult. Xi Jinping has cracked down on this really systematically. What is your sense of how people are feeling right at the moment in China about the Congress, the direction of the country? Chinese people are definitely giving a quite mixed reactions um, about the Congress. Um, even though the party's Congress it means it is a series of closed door meeting and the discussions and meeting agendas are not really public and transparent for the public. Um, but there are people who have much closer ties to the Communist Party and the government officials are closely watching it and trying to figure out what will be the latest directives from the General Secretary Xi Jinping. Um, and um, for everyday Chinese people, what we can see is that they don't really care about what has been discussed. Probably one of the most significant questions is that whether um, Mr. Xi is still going to continue his COVID-0 strategy, mm -hmm. which had a huge impact on everyday people's life. At the same time, we've been seeing a lot of people um, they've having that fatigue about you know living their lives under that strategy for more than three years without being able to go overseas um, without being able to establish their businesses um, and there is a huge um, sentiment against that at the moment so it's interesting uh, it will be interesting to see how it will develop in the next 72 hours yeah it is interesting because of course there had been so much opportunity for people that as you say even when we heard from Matty that uncertainty for businesses in investing in terms of what that might look like um, is there the sense that he is now embarking on an ideology that wasn't what the Chinese people were hoping for for example, for people uh, living in some established areas such as Shanghai or uh, Guangzhou, um, those economic develop, de developed cities uh, around uh, the country, um, they are really feeling that um, what uh, Mr. Xi pledged in the past are not being delivered properly. For example, he made the pledge to uh, realize common prosperity in the next couple of years as one of his major policies. Um, but the, in fact, the reality, reality is that uh, the most um, you know, uh, cities in China are going through lockdowns and different phases of COVID-0 strategies. and people are suffering from the uh, financial and um, economic pains. And at the same time, Mr. Xi um, made the pledge to gradually give Chinese people more democratic rights. But at the same time, we've been seeing that he tightened up the space for freedom of speech, as well as uh, imposing crackdowns in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. And uh, he also had his signature anti-corruption uh, campaign, uh, which we've seen more than 3 million Chinese government officials and communist party members are punished by that campaign. But later, Chinese people realized that it has become one of his tools to tackle and punish his political rivals in China. Yeah, it's a way of suppression and control. But realistically, do you see any chance that there's going to be a challenge to him, that he's going to loosen his grip on power? If there is any challenge, um, those people only have less than 20, 72 hours. But apparently, um, as we mentioned, the anti-corruption campaign that he successfully used um, in the past um, 10 years has already made his political rivals um, has really limited chances um, to actually challenge him in the next three days. Um, and for everyday Chinese people, they are confused about where Mr. Xi is leading the country towards uh, what is the direction of the future of China. Um, we've seen the upper class Chinese people, they want to quietly uh, live and enjoy their wealth and privilege. 
and we've seen Mr. Xi had a sweeping crackdown on some um, booming industries, including the technology sectors and the property markets. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't want to challenge it because they will lose their status and privilege if they do that, such as Jack Ma. Um, we've seen uh, the middle class Chinese people, especially the majority of them are the um, one child generation, uh, one child policy generation, and they feel the pressure on their shoulders. Um, they are more thinking about how they can survive in this economic downturn and uh, what is the consequence it would be. Um, for example, the government is encouraging them to have more children, but in fact they have um, four parents if they are married um, to support in the future. Um, how do they survive? And for the lower class Chinese people, it will be more challenging because the only thing they probably are thinking at the moment is the next meal mm. rather than politics. Yeah, indeed. Great to get that perspective from you, Bang. Thank you so much. Good to be with you today. Take care. Well, over its 101-year history, the Chinese Communist Party has never elected a woman to its top hierarchy standing committee. And that's unlikely to change when this historic Congress draws to a close this weekend. And what we're going to see is another Men in Black style group photo. These are the most powerful members in the history of China's Communist Party. But you might notice that something is missing here. There aren't any women. In fact, no women has ever ruled the People's Republic of China or even been part of CCP's top leadership group, the Politburo Standing Committee. It currently has seven members, or men, led by the party's chairman, Xi Jinping. These guys make the most important decisions in China. But this weekend, the National Congress will decide who will be on the committee for the next five years. So could a woman be about to be selected for a top leadership position for the very first time? Well, if history is anything to go by, probably not. Even though China's former Chairman Mao once said women hold up half the sky, the highly leader board of the Chinese Communist Party has always been a boys club. It's, it's always been like this and this can create bias in nomination and the, the selection process. Uh, for leading positions in the party state. The CCP has more than 96 million party members, but only 29% of them are female, around 28 million Chinese women. When it comes to the Congress, women make up even less, about 27% of the nearly 2,300 representatives, that's only 619 women. China is a very patriarchal society, right? There is still this Confucian idea of male outside, female inside, which is quite um, prevalent. Still, there have been important women in the party's history. One of them is Mao's wife, Jiang Qing. She was a major political figure during China's Cultural Revolution. Another example is Deng Yingchao, who was a member of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Her husband is China's first premier, Zhou Enlai. But even then, many of the party's most famous women are still associated with their husbands, who were often powerful politicians. And none of them have ever been elected to the key decision-making body, the Politburo Standing Committee. So even though in recent years, China has seen a growing number of people calling for women to have more rights and power. The male-dominated culture in the party's leadership means women still don't have much chance to be represented among China's political elites. It might make a difference if there were more women in the party's top leadership, yet it is unclear how different it would be given how opaque China's political structure is. And we do see closer intergenerational ties and also rising tension between traditionalism and individualism. This kind of puts challenge on women in China as well. So under the new family planning policy, the three child policy, for example, uh, that aim to elevate China's um, declining birth rate, it's getting more and more difficult for women to advance their um, career and climb up the political ladder.
Well, as Joyce just explained, at the centre of the CCP's power structure is the seven-member Polit Politburo Standing Committee. And with the Congress underway, should we expect to see a major reshuffle right at the top of Chinese politics? Well, let's bring back in our East Asia correspondent, Bill Bertels, and fellow at the Department of Pacific Affairs at the ANU, Graham Smith. Nice to see you both. Um, Graham, let's start with you. What can we expect, do you think, from the makeup of this group in coming years, given she is wanting to entrench his power. Yeah, there's a few things we should be looking for. Um, I guess the thing of most interest is, are we going to see any sign of a successor? And if there's no one in this group who's under the age of 60, um, then there's no successor in there, because the way he's looking is another two terms at least of him in power and then handing over to someone else. So um, it's hard to see. There's two options. One, he could clear the slate and kind of get rid of a lot of people by shifting the age limits or he could go with a sort of a stability approach and just let the two who are due to retire retire and replace them with a couple of safe choices. Bill what are your thoughts what do you expect to see? Well Bev I suppose the only real key thing aside from the successor is whether or not Xi Jinping manages to stack the uh, top cabinet with his loyalists uh, if he does, then uh, he'll be around for a long time, you would presume. But if he doesn't, if um, the makeup of the top cabinet, the Politburo Standing Committee, is a little bit more mixed in the backgrounds of the men, and they all will be men who are in that position, then perhaps that will indicate a bit of internal, de a bit, a bit more internal debate at the top level over the next few years about China's direction than you would get if it's just a she show of loyalists. Yeah. How, you know, when we think back to Deng Xiaoping, to both of you, you know, he enshrined these set terms that are about to be basically set aside and, and rolled over to prevent this kind of power grab, this long-term um, power situation where one man rules the roost. Um, how damaging is this potentially going to be for China? Well, I mean, we're moving into kind of cult territory, if you like, and that is very dangerous. Um, China's been through this before with Mao. Um, the only difference being, as a friend of mine, Jeremy Barmay, put it, um, it, it's a cult of personality without the personality. <laughs> um, and so where do you go from here? Because you don't have the predictability of succession. You don't know who's going to take over. Um, and that leads to all kinds of cult-like behaviours where the feedback loops don't work anymore. He's surrounded by sycophants who are basically competing amongst each other to come up with formulations that please him the most. And then you get this real disconnect from the reality of China, which is you know, incredibly complex to run. And if you're getting bad feedback, then you're making bad decisions. Bill? Yeah, Bev, I haven't seen anybody advocate a case for continuing the leadership of Xi Jinping. A few years ago, you'd have some uh, loyalists in, say, Chinese state media who would say, look, yeah, if that one man is running the show in a really strong way, then uh, why would you uh, want to get rid of him if he's, going, if he's taking the country in a more confident, stronger direction? Um, you don't really hear much of that now with the COVID zero economic slump, with Xi Jinping's rather poorly timed decision to declare an all-out friendship with Russia right before Putin invaded Ukraine. The gloss has really come off this bloke and uh, the idea that uh, he should continue his rule unopposed, possibly with even more loyalists underneath him right at the top of the party. Uh, I haven't seen anybody making a, a strong defence of this in the lead up, possibly because the system is so opaque that even though everybody in China and around the world knows that he's going to walk out first over the weekend and once again commence a five-year term, nobody officially will say it uh, in the government structure, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. Yeah. You know, in his opening speech, um, I think that the notion of being on a war footing or a war preparedness was mentioned about 89 or 90 times compared to the economic focus that we've seen of recent congresses. What, what does this mean? What does China want to be? We know, of course, that it wants Taiwan back in the fold. But what does this mean for how China sees itself on the global stage? Uh, Bill, do you want to go first? 
Uh, well, I'll just, on this, uh, the point was made by uh, an Australian uh, long-term observer of China, Chris Buckley, uh, one of the, uh, Australia's top experts on China, New York Times journalist, that up until this Congress, in recent Congresses, uh, she or previous leaders had said that China is in a period of strategic opportunity, which uh, basically meant that uh, the country should focus on economic growth. But that sort of language is being stripped out this year and instead Xi Jinping is warning of uh, uncertain uh, times ahead. He talked about uh, headwinds, even the possibility of devastating storms. He said we need to prepare for worst case scenarios. So this clearly means that uh, China does not see a sort of golden opportunity simply to pump up its economy as fast as possible anymore, probably because we've already uh, realize, they've realised in recent years it's not as easy to sustain high levels of growth. But the second thing is the opposition in recent years to Xi Jinping's uh, government from particularly the United States but also its allies including in Australia has mounted pretty quickly. There's been a lot of pushback. Uh, democracies around the world taking measures to try and strengthen their systems against things like uh, Chinese government influence and, uh, and uh, Chinese uh, economic takeovers of strategic companies in Europe and so forth. So I think uh, it, that's, and just in the couple, last couple of days, Joe Biden has made a big uh, um, stance on uh, US chip technology going to China. He's put in place measures that apparently, according to multiple accounts, uh, are making uh, an impact on China's ability to obtain high level chips. So. I think all these things are quite obvious now and the idea that uh, opportunity abounds is not really the flavour of the month anymore in China. It is much more of a sort of bunker down mentality, us against the world and that's kind of the tone that you got from Xi Jinping's opening speech. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add that, I mean, for Xi Jinping himself, this whole idea of struggle is a very personal thing. So in his own life, his own family was one of the most roughly treated in the Cultural Revolution. And the lesson he took from it wasn't that the party could get things really badly wrong. It was that, you know, you had to suffer to become a good Communist Party member. So the audience for the Party Congress isn't so much us, it's all the party members, 90 million plus back in China. And he's telling them basically, you have to be like me, this is going to be hard, but you know, hard is what's good and struggle is what's good. So um, this is what people are having to turn up and study, um, you know, almost to death throughout China and will have to study even further in the wake of the Congress. Yeah, indeed. It's, it's, and it's very much like Putin stuck in his KGB suspicion of anything outside of the Soviet Union. It's that he's trapping China now in a different mindset. You know, Bill, we were talking earlier about those comments made out as a consequence of the Manchester uh, um, protest and we should remind people that you were forced out of the country um, and as there was this crackdown on free reporting any form of dissent we've seen it in China brutally but what's fascinating now is this push for greater foreign influence this, this desire to believe that any China representation be it the diaspora or a consulate or an ambassador a embassy is 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 up to China to decide how they they operate that. Yeah, and it's not new for the Chinese leader or for the Chinese Communist Party to tell the nation to be on guard against Western values. But Xi Jinping really doubled down on this in particularly the second term. Um, making speeches which over time were, if they weren't public initially, they were subsequently revealed and publicised, uh, where he told uh, various cadres, you need to, we need to fully reject Western notions of democracy, of rule of law, of uh, independent judiciary, of uh, a Western concept of journalism. You know, he, he really has uh, tried to reinforce this idea that China is basically in an ideological battle with these Western notions. And we're seeing this spill out across all fronts at places like the United Nations. Chinese diplomats had a huge win in uh, recent weeks when they were able to thwart an attempt led by the US, but also countries like Australia, to have a UN debate about the report by the UN Human Rights Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in uh, Xinjiang. And the Chinese government was able to rally the numbers and get enough countries to uh, knock down that idea of having a debate. So in, across all fronts, 
I think Xi Jinping has quite clearly locked into a, a very ideological worldview. It's China and fellow authoritarian states, but led by China, versus Western states that are all out to contain China, plus nations like Japan. And I don't know how seriously people in the West have been taking this idea of a conflict between the two, but Xi Jinping, from his language in the opening speech, is a hardcore ideologue, a hardcore true believer. And it's probably an, a good time, I suppose, for people to understand that rather than for people to kind of dismiss him simply as a cynical politician who says all this Marxist rhetoric simply for his own uh, political power. And Graham, does that lead to, you know, this greater sort of tentacles of foreign interference, which was also referenced today? Yeah, this certainly leads to greater paranoia about tentacles of foreign interference. I mean, we've seen them drink this Kool-Aid before. Uh, I mean, in the wake of Tiananmen, rather than blaming it on corruption or rampant inflation, they blamed it on George Soros, you know, for goodness sake. Um, Taiwan, likewise, in the rhetoric about Taiwan in his speech, all these references to external forces. So basically saying the US has cooked up all this opposition to reunification. You know, missing the fact that less than 2% of Taiwanese people want to be reunified with the mainland. Like, it's amazing if the US could have done that, but uh, unfortunately, largely it's China's own efforts at disinformation, at cyber attacks um, in, in Taiwan that have really pushed them away from the mainland, not uh, anything the US in its ineffectual Voice of America kind of way has, uh, has managed to do. Mm. It feels, just a final question to you both and a brief one, it feels like it's going to be difficult um, for any nation, and Bill talked a bit about China-Australia relations, but for any nation to have proper relations, proper, you know, bilateral relations with China into the future. Uh, yeah, I'll just chip in, Bev, and say that I, I think the easier days, the peak of Australia-China relations have well and truly passed. That was probably five, six, seven, eight years ago. That's the same for China-US. Any China-European nation relationship has, has, has basically peaked because how on earth can you build more trustworthy, more integrated ties with a leadership in China that is so utterly paranoid, as Graham says, about any form of Western influence or Western involvement within China itself? Final word to you, yeah. Graham. <laughs> Look, it's, it's difficult. I and mean, we have, uh, we have uh, Xiao Tian who is there and always puts on a smiling face in public. But the difficulty comes is the words that he is obliged to say in order to please his bosses back in Beijing, send a chill through Anna in Australia. When he, when he used the words about Taiwan, use your imagination for what might happen. Absolutely chilling. And yet this is a guy who's supposedly selling, a, you know, a friendlier relations. You can't use the language that you have as a Chinese diplomat these days and build foreign relations with, you know, democracies. Sure, it might work in Saudi Arabia just fine, but uh, maybe not here. Yeah, the, the countries where it is working is mounting up. Great to have you both on. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bev. Thanks, Bev. And that's where we're going to end our special coverage of the historic CCP Congress. As we have reported, it is expected to cement Xi Jinping's rule over China for several years to come.